Well, I've been to Micro Center again. See the sticker? <laughs> it turns out when you take your Leo Bodnar latency measuring device to Micro Center and start plugging it into things, uh, they sort of frown on that a bit. I wanted to pick this up. This is the Tough Gaming VG1A series. Uh, it's not exactly a fun model number. Uh, the VG27AQL1A. This is the Tough, but there's also a Strix version. And I was driving myself insane trying to figure out what the difference was between this and the Strix version. And I didn't want to buy them both. So here we are. All right, first up, what you should know about this display is it's 27 inches, 2560 by 1440. So, you know, standard widescreen resolution. It is up to 170 Hertz. Out of the box, it's 144. It'll overclock to 170. It's IPS, one millisecond response time, 130% sRGB, G-Sync compatible. It's HDR 400. HDR 400 is sort of the lowest end of the HDR. I sort of mockingly call it HD. It's high definition without the range. That's the joke. The reason that I picked this one over the Strix is one, because the Strix was a lot more. And for my use case, I actually thought this was a better monitor, a better monitor that costs less. We're gonna put it to the test. But first, let's take a look at what you get in the box. You've got a DisplayPort cable and an HDMI cable. I'm immediately suspect of the DisplayPort cables after my experiences with the Asus UX, or no, uh, U43UQ, PGU, PG43UQ, something, something like that. The 43 inch, it was not a good cable. So we have an external power brick. There is a built-in USB 3 hub, so it comes with a reasonable feeling USB 3 cable. I like this locking mechanism for sure. One thing I really like about this stand is that you can rotate it to the left or the right because manufacturers are finally getting clued in that people sometimes want to run their display in a vertical configuration. And depending on whether the display is on the left or the right, you may want to rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise. If you're not into the stand, that's okay. There's built-in Visa mounting holes here. You can just pop the, uh, the clamp thing off here that rotates and use a standard 100 millimeter Visa mount with this display. And this display is not very heavy, remember, because it's got the external power brick. In terms of controls, you've got four buttons on the back panel here, as well as a five-way hat switch. So four ways, plus you can push on the, the control there. In terms of inputs, we have two HDMI 2.0, along with the DisplayPort 1.2. So the DisplayPort 1.2, you know, that's gonna top out at 144 hertz, 170 hertz, definitely an overclock. This is a USB 3, five gigabit hub. So you've got two USB 3 ports on the bottom as well as the USB 3 type B input. In terms of fit and finish and construction, it's pretty well constructed. It's, if anything, unremarkable. I don't mean that in a, in a disparaging kind of a way. The build quality here, I mean, the, the feet themselves are plastic clad metal. The stand is pretty robust. It is height adjustable as well as the rotation that I demonstrated. It's a pretty solid build without being overbuilt, if that makes sense. The plastic, you know, gives a little bit when I flex on it. The bezels, the front panel is kind of a matte color. The, the bezels are, you know, sort of small. This isn't really um, all that remarkable. This is about what I get when we're looking at other brands of monitor, even you know monitor brands that are known for being lower cost, like Pixio, have a comparable build quality to this display from ASUS. But this is this is also the tough gaming line. That, you know the ROG Strix, maybe some of the build quality things are what you get when you pay extra on the ROG Strix side of things. But this is perfectly fine. This is a, a reasonable build quality. For me, the most eye-opening thing with display HDR was Resident Evil, the new Resident Evil 8, and that's the first game that I played where the display, like the HDR, even though this is only HDR 400, was genuinely very impressive. The most direct comparison to this display is from ASUS. It's the ROG Strix XG27AQ. It's very, very similar to this display. The response time in the ROG Strix display is a little bit faster than the Tough Gaming, but still at 144 hertz. And with the Chase Squares testing, it's not bad. The brightness and contrast and color aspects of this display are worse out of the box than the ROG Strix, but better very slightly after tuning, especially brightness. The brightness of this display, I think would work a little bit better in a bright room than the XG27 AQ. Also, and this is weird, playing with this display and playing with the Strix version, the Strix 27 inch display in Micro Center, the display HDR 400 experience on this display was definitely better. Like I'm a crazy person and you know, I'm not colorblind or anything, 
Definitely my brain is broken in some ways, but the HDR experience on this monitor was definitely better than the Strix monitor, which is very baffling and is a large part of the reason why I went with this monitor versus splurging on the Strix. I also thought that the Strix looked worse in the vertical orientation, side to side, you know, when we're talking about, you know, maybe using it as a vertical panel, which I tend to do with these 2560 by 1440 displays, especially if you know you go a big 4K monitor and then you know you've upgraded from this, but you keep, want to keep using this for a couple of years. These make great portrait side monitors for your giant, you know, 40 inch or 38 inch or whatever 4K monitor that's in the middle. Another thing I noticed with this display comparing them side by side was that the the coating that's on this display is much much darker um, than the Strix. So, and the display being brighter, even though it's darker, it has the potential to better hide things like IPS glow and IPS bloom. I mean, IPS glow and IPS bloom is a problem with all displays. So this is what this display looks like in the dark. It's pretty good as far as IPS panels go. I mean, you know, something like OLED or direct transmission, yes, is absolutely gonna be better. It's hard to get rich deep blacks with an IPS type panel because the backlight is on in the back, but it does have local dimming. Text clarity on this display is excellent. That is, of course, owing to the RGB pixel layout. No surprises there. And finally, the options in the on-screen display for configuring the display and things like that. With Asus, yeah, it's higher end. Asus is a cut above the rest when it comes to that kind of software and integration. It does work really well for configuring the menu options. There's also the USB interface and maybe on the software side, but I'm not gonna get into that for this video. Now, in terms of OSD and the Asus special sauce, there's a lot in here. First off, color. If you want to match what I did in color, you got to go to user and set 99 and 99 for the red and green, but blue stays at 100. That gives me a pretty much a perfect alignment on the calibration device for red, green, and blue. For whatever reason, uh, green just wants to blow out in most of the profiles. I don't understand it. For gaming features, this panel does have a lot of stuff to help you cheat. I mean, win, find the edge in games. One of them is a uh, shadow boost. So if there's something that's dark on screen, you can crank shadow boost and see what's in the shadows. It's akin to the old school texture hacking. Not really, sort of, kinda. In old school games, not the one where you could see through walls, but the ones where you could see in the dark. It's kind of like that, but I guess that's pretty cool. It has the standard stuff like crosshairs, which is on pretty much every monitor these days, an FPS counter, some display alignment stuff. There's some pretty cool features in the OSD of this display. Since this display had three inputs, I was thinking maybe it would have some picture by picture or picture in picture support, but I did not see that in the on-screen display menu. So if you're looking for that, not so much. There's also eco mode, vivid pixel, and ELMB. So ELMB is a pretty cool, feature. It's from Asus. It's pretty much an Asus special sauce thing, but it combines V-Sync with how the backlight is strobed. It is off by default. It makes me motion sick when I turn it on, but what it does is it flashes the backlight at the same time that a frame is ready. It's recommended for 100 to 120 hertz because you're going to get a headache if you see a 60 hertz flicker of the, of the backlight. I get a headache at a 100 hertz flicker. I just rather have the backlight on all the time. I don't need the backlight to flash whenever something is going to be displayed on the screen. In the past, this wasn't possible with things like cold cathode, you know, uh, fluorescent tubes, which are used for the background because they'll glow for a little bit while they're off. LEDs will glow a little bit, but not as much as uh, cold cathode fluorescent tubes. So this will flash the LEDs in the backlight on when the frame is ready and being displayed. So persistence of vision, you know, eyeball hackery. It's a pretty cool feature and it was really awesome at first and then the motion sickness set in, but it's pretty cool. I mean, if you're into that kind of thing, it's, it's definitely something that's unique. Asus special sauce as far as I know, you might wanna check that out and see what you think. In terms of Chase Squares, real-time display latency, that kind of thing, it is a really high-end display. There are no complaints here. Text smoothness for scrolling is some of the smoothest text scrolling that I've ever seen. And even if you just use this display for productivity, if you look really closely at how smooth this is in video, I mean, granted, this is getting a little crunchy because it's going through YouTube and who knows what the algorithm is doing to it. And is it even 60 FPS? I don't even know. But once you use a high refresh rate, like 100 hertz, 120 hertz, 144 hertz, for things like text scrolling, and you see really amazing crisp text scrolling, it kinda is life-changing, and that may be something that you want as part of your productivity workflow, uh, given how nice it really is, and it is very nice on this panel. This panel's real-world response time is something on the order of about seven, eight milliseconds, give or take. We can see in the Chase Squares test that we've got 
two squares on that are on at any given time. One's kind of coming on and the other one's going off, uh, you know, doing our high speed camera photography. As far as an IPS display goes, this is really good. We can also see here from our display in the dark that the IPS glow is pretty good. And that's like, because I was saying, you know, there's kind of a dark filter on this display meant to hide whatever glow is there. It's still there. You still get a little bit of a vignette. You can see that on, a, on an all white screen because it is an IPS display, but this is just a common feature of IPS monitors and you should be, I shouldn't be telling you anything you don't already know about IPS monitors when you're considering the different types of panels. IPS generally better color accuracy, better use for production work, things like HDR 400, yeah it's pretty good. TN and VA panels, it can be hit and miss because historically those panels are not as good as IPS for that kind of thing, but they can be better in terms of response time and latency. It depends on the generation of the display panel and a whole bunch of other factors. Old school TN panels are terrible like the Samsung U28D590D. That was a TN panel that advertised one millisecond displays and it was actually literally garbage. It was on the order of like 50 milliseconds between frames when you are talking about a worst case gray on gray scenario. It was not great. This display is incredible, absolutely incredible. So when I picked this display up, basically mid-year 2021, it was about $400. $400 is a little bit of a premium over comparable panels from other brands that are perhaps smaller than Asus, let's say. Um, but this display did a few things better. I was surprised maybe that the color calibration out of the box wasn't great, but the panel does lend itself to being really uh, calibrated really well. The 130% sRGB claim on the side of the box is not inaccurate. That actually works pretty well for color calibration. We use the Spider 5 Pro along with uh, Display Cal to get this thing calibrated. And uh, it really, it, 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 the color's dialed in nicely. You really wouldn't go wrong picking this monitor. Um, if you want a little bit of uh, you know, assurance or uh, peace of mind from the Asus brand, you're paying a little bit of a premium to get that. But you know, you get it with this monitor. You know, it's not, uh, there's nothing here that would give me pause, in other words. I think Asus has, has put together a perfectly reasonable monitor and the specs bear that out. If you'd like to download our calibration file, which is probably not perfect, but it's probably better than what you got out of the box, you can get that at the forum uh, at forum.level1text.com. I'm Wendell Up signing out, and I'll see you there. If you got one of these and you want to show off your setup or your battle station, definitely post a picture on the forum. I'd love to see it. I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.